I know what I'm carrying the javelin for. Do you, though? Do you really? Hey, guys. Mud from HQC. Sorry there's no commentary this week. We're currently battling some copyright claims, and there's a small gap in the schedule. So I stepped in to talk about the hottest 2021 superhero film. The Suicide Squad has become a smash hit, one of the breakout films of 2021, and is absolutely reinventing the superhero genre. Okay, so that's not entirely true. Commercially, it's drowning like weasel. Spoilers. But critically, and with fans, it looks to be on track to become one of DCEU's best films, up there with the Snyder Cut, Wonder Woman, and Shazam. Now, I do have a hand to play in the terrible box office return. As a casual who watched this from the comfort of a knockoff casting couch with the glory that is HBO Max. But while I was watching this film in my brightly lit bedroom, casually checking my phone every 20 minutes, and building my Lego Seinfeld soundstage set, I was struck by an idea that just stuck in my brain, and I couldn't shake it. Harley Quinn does not matter in this film. Now, this is a normal criticism that you can lob at most ensemble films. However, what makes it rather egregious to me is that in this film, Harley's not a member of the ensemble. She's given her own plot, divorced from the squad, and reunites with them when her character arc is completed in the film. But despite getting her own subplot in the film, her impact on the plot itself is negligible to the point where it would be almost nothing to remove her from the film. You were gonna save me? It was a really good plan, too. This struck me during one of the opening scenes. The Suicide Squad has made their landing at Corto Maltese. There's a bit of banter back and forth. A large explosion goes off in the distance, bringing the audience's attention back to the first squad, and we see Harley Quinn fighting for her life, the sole survivor. She's captured, and the camera jumps to Rick Flagg, the other sole survivor. Despite being directly next to Harley in his last shot, he somehow made his way into the jungle around the perimeter of guards that was surrounding them. Waller seems to have sacrificed the first team by alerting authorities to the fact that Pete Davidson had escaped Staten Island. What stands out to me here was how these few shots are edited together and done so... strangely. Both Rick and Harley's scene feel like they're meant to flow directly from the conversation Bloodsport and Waller have. But the jump from Harley to Flag is a stark smash cut without much setup to it. Obviously, every edit does not have to be the deepest, most seamless cut, perfectly setting the tone for every moment of the film. Some cuts can just be hard cuts, but it still doesn't change the fact that Harley's bit almost feels out of place. What really stands out is that later on in the film, Flag seems surprised to learn that Harley is still alive. We never see how they separate, just a quick explosion and then Harley's running across the beach. For a film with otherwise really good editing, this scene caught my attention as just a really strange moment that kind of gets never brought up again. With that mini rant out of the way, let's talk about Harley's journey through the film, with a rather quick clinical overview of everything that happens to her. She's reintroduced to the first Suicide Squad, a decoy squad, who all, mostly, die. She witnesses the death of her best friend, Boomer. No, the other Boomer. As he gets shredded by a helicopter before being inexplicably separated from Rick Flagg and taken prisoner. From there, she meets General Silvio Luna and executes him. After this, she gets tortured, breaks out, and reunites with the squad, then helps them blow up Jotunheim and battle Starro. After a death fakeout, she plunges into Starro's eye and watches from the inside as he dies. She survives the film, laments the loss of Flag, and then flies off. On the surface, there are two major beats that Harley seems essential to, killing Silvio Luna and diving into Starro's eye. But if we really break down the events surrounding these moments and the fallout from them, it's clear Harley's presence doesn't do anything. Let's start with moment one, General Luna. After being captured, she's surprisingly freed and dressed up. She's brought to General Luna, who gives her a, a day in the life of luxury. She plays princess, and we get insight into Sylvia's character. They end up screwing, decide to get married, and then Harley kills him. Boom! One of the major bad guys of the film dealt with. Good job, Harley. Except this event has literally zero effect on the plot. In fact, beyond the next scene where General Mateo is made dictator, Luna is never brought up again in the film. Harley gets a monologue in the scene about how she's grown to be able to see red flags in her boyfriends and is starting to deal with them in a typical Harley fashion. Recently, I made a promise to myself that the next time I got a boyfriend, I'd be on the lookout for red flags. And if I saw any, I would do the healthy thing. And I would murder him. She's learned to be independent. That's great continued through narrative from Birds of Prey. In fact, Harley's probably the only character in the DCEU with a good solid through narrative like this, aside from maybe Diana. But does this really elevate Harley from where she was at the end of Birds of Prey? Not really. She already killed the patriarchy in her last outing, and in a much more satisfying manner. 
this could have been intentional by director James Gunn. A quick commentary in that in a regime like this, cutting the head off the Hydra only makes it grow back stronger. But it's not treated like that. Or like anything, really. If they'd wanted to drill that in, perhaps maybe a scene later on where Harley declares Luna's death a great success, only for the squad to realize that they've accomplished nothing towards their main goal and have maybe even made their lives harder. Maybe even have Harley lament killing such a nice monster for nothing. You know what I'm talking about. Regardless, that scene's not in the film, which actually leads me into a quick side tangent for this film that sets up a point for the second half of this discussion. The villain defeat satisfaction problem. There's arguably five antagonists presented to the squad. President Luna, dispatched by Harley. Peacemaker, dispatched by Deja, I mean Bloodsport. President Suarez and the Thinker, both dispatched by Starro, who was then in kind dispatched by Best Girl Ratcatcher 2. Let's compare the two deaths we can attribute to the squad, Peacemaker and Starro, against Harley's execution of General Luna, and see how they measure up. And yes, I know Peacemaker's still alive, shut up. Starting off, Peacemaker. He and Deadshot, Bloodsport, have a rivalry all film. At the time of his death, he's just off Rick Flag, much to the horror of Katana and June Moon. Throughout the film, he's driving the squad to make tough calls about their job. He's about to send Ratcatcher 2 back home to her dad when Bloodsport appears. Bloodsport and Ratcatcher 2 have been bonding throughout the film, and RT2's a clear stand-in for Zoe, Bloodsport's daughter with whom he has a strained relationship. Bloodsport saves RT2 and disposes of Peacemaker in a satisfying way, avenging Flag and completing his character arc, learning to care about others, as well as a callback to the first line of their rivalry. Up next, RT2 and Starro. She shields Bloodsport, kind of, from her rats as they charge into Starro and kill it. Ratism, the best song from the soundtrack, swarms into your ears as a wild Taika Waititi appears to deliver a poignant monologue that really makes you reflect on who RT2 is. She's small, she's mousy, but she has the biggest impact. She's a villain, a thief, but so loving. She befriended the shark, she helped Bloodshot realize how much he loves his daughter, she's so innocent she even made Peacemaker reflect for a moment. There's no great rivalry between RT2 and Starro, but it's an emotional payoff for her character. Then of course in this scene, we have Harley. Something I haven't mentioned up to this point, which is surprising since it's the namesake of the video, is the Javelin. One of the disposable squad, Javelin, has a signature weapon. A... Javelin. When he dies, he hands it to Harley, asking her to use it on the right enemy. Idea established. Later on, when she breaks out from being tortured, she finds the Javelin displayed for her on her heads-up display. Reinforce the idea. Finally, when the squad turns back to fight Starro, she declares she knows what it's for, using it to pierce Starro's eye and allowing RT2's army of cooks into the eye to kill it. Boom. Assist for Harley. Except... The javelin itself is... nothing special. We are never told it has any special properties. Not that it's enchanted, not that it's forged from strange metals like Atlantean steel or Amazonian steel, anything like that. It's just a sharp stick. So then, why did it have to be the javelin? Bullets are shot at Starro and they seem to just plank off. Rats have sharp teeth and claws for climbing and chewing, and they clearly are be shown to be of concern for Starro when they swarm him. Hell, those sharp teeth are what ultimately put Starro down. So once again, in the quick moment, Harley seems to contribute to the story in moving the plot forward, but it's something so minute it could easily be changed with very little rewriting. So what's my point to all this? Well, after doing some research, I've come up with a theory. Harley was added to the script well after the plot had been settled upon. We've gotten a lot of news out since the film's release, and even during the run-up to it, that there had been some script changes during the writing phase. Completely normal in a big film like this, no first draft is ever perfect, and obviously Gunn's decisions were largely for the best, given the film's critical and commercial... Critical success. One of these articles that stood out to me was a Screen Rant article that was recently released, detailing how Gunn didn't even know Harley Quinn was getting a solo film when he was writing The Suicide Squad. While on the surface, this seems funny and a symptom of DCEU's scatterbrain style, I think it's more telling that Gunn initially did not plan on using Harley. I do think he changed his mind and added her early enough that her presence in the film isn't entirely alien, but not early enough that he could incorporate her well. Similar to how Bloodsport's presence works, but he's clearly dead shot. That's a rant for another time, though. Though I will say, this is where I suspect things changed. When it was confirmed Will Smith would not be returning for the sequel and that Idris Elba was changed to Bloodsport, I think somewhere in there, Gunn decided to add Harley, another holdover from the first film to ground it there, tie it back. Obviously, the script went through heavy rewrites in the early stages. Deadshot was going to be, well, Deadshot. RT2 was supposed to die in Pokemon. Pokemon, man. RT2 was supposed to die and Polkadot Man was supposed to live, etc., etc., etc. Gunn's competent enough that he can add Harley in without making much fuss, but I do think he was already set on a larger story and didn't want to just write, and also Harley's there, to all the scenes. Speaking of writing, though, I did also note a few other things. On Wikipedia, 
It says that Harley Quinn and Amanda Waller were the first characters Gunn decided to bring back. However, upon further inspection of the sources for this article, it explicitly states that Waller was the first character he chose to bring back, whilst he was happy to explore Harley's lunacy established by air. This article, from Den of Geek, was published in April of 2021, so well after production had wrapped. And the second source on it seems to just be referencing the first. What's more, there's a bit above it in a different paragraph where it's noted that WB wanted Gunn to use Harley. Makes sense. She's super marketable. And for the sake of fairness, I'll also say there's an article about the many, many deaths in the script and the cast's reaction. Margot Robbie even notes that her initial script, Phase 1, what she got, noted that she lives beginning to end. It's hard to deny that in an ensemble film where she's given her own subplot, Harley feels like an unthrown javelin. Sorry there's no commentary this week. We're currently battling some copyright claims, and there's a small gap in the schedule. I love King Shark. I fucking love King Shark. Who doesn't love King Shark? I fucking love the shark. We love the shark on this channel. It's the shark! It's the shark. How am I going to be mad at the shark? It is the shark. It's about goddamn time you got the shark.